Yeah, thanks a lot um, and welcome to this presentation about sequential testing in general and our, this means get your guides approach to a sequential testing called BaseMath. Um, so get your guide is a two market, uh, two sided marketplace for um, touristic activities, think of tickets from museums or guided tours. This is all I will tell you about the company and about us. If you have further questions, you can ask them in the Q&A. Uh, let's rather dive into A-B testing. So I thought since this is a search conference, I should make some connection to search. So you see on the snapshots um, the, the search box of our, of our platform. And um, the, the original copy that we always put there was this, where are you going, which would nudge visitors to entering a location like Paris or London or whatever. But since the search capabilities um, of our internal search are much uh, stronger than just identifying locations, and if you're interested, there's another talk after this one at Machine House exactly about this topic, um, we thought it might be wise to, to change the copy to um, search get your guide. And this obviously is a very classical case of A-B testing, like you want to change something and you want to know if it triggers the behavior you want to see. So you have this control variation, you have the treatment variation, you have samples, in this case you have the visitors who are seeing the search box and the samples then um, get a value, which in this case is binary, either visitor um, basically interacts with the search box, this would be a success coded as a one, or he or she doesn't, then it would be a zero failure um, they wouldn't interact with it. And then um, in this simple example, we do a 50-50 split, so half of the visitors are randomly assigned to the control and half of the visitors will see the treatment. So th this is pretty standard and um, you can basically then um, plot the performance with these graphs. So what you see in pink and green is basically the accumulated sum of all the successes um, based on the sample size. So you have to think of the visitors coming in as a stream, visitor by visitor, and like each visitor comes then with a zero or one, and you just sum up these numbers. And obviously this must always be increasing, it can never go down. And what you also see here, that it's a pretty tight race between green and pink, so sometimes control is a little bit better, sometimes treatment is a little bit better, um, but overall it's pretty tight. You can even simplify like the information contained in these two graphs by just looking at the difference, which is plotted here in black. Um, so this is just the performance of the treatment minus the performance of the control and not surprisingly this is fluctuating around zero. Now this is basically the representation we will stick to for the rest of, of this presentation. And um, what you see here is basically a simulation of a lot of experiments all represented by this difference function. And you see that I colored half of the experiment simulated here in blue and the other half in red. So the difference is very easy with the blue ones. I assume basically that this is an AA test. So the probability that a visitor would interact with the search box is the same for the treatment and for the control. And not surprisingly then um, the, the difference function basically fluctuates around the zero. The solid uh, light blue line that you see is the um, mean, and, and you see this is pretty stable around zero. On the other hand, the, the red experiments that you see, there I simulated the case that the treatment is in fact better than the control, so we have a higher um, probability that the visitor will interact with, um, with the search bar. And um, this then basically um, in, in this representation shows up as like a linear drift up. And um, this is basically a representation of the law of large numbers. And this actually enables us at all to make a call if a given experiment, the path of a given experiment belongs to the red or the blue family. 
And this is then also what you do in like the default case, like you usually pre-compute a particular sample size that you need, or we often speak about like a running time because usually you have a particular volume per day, so you can translate it into the days you need to run your experiment until you have reached the samples that you need. And then you have some statistical tests that give you a decision boundary, and basically everything that is above the decision boundary, you will declare as significantly positive, like saying there is an uplift, and everything that is below um, will, will basically be, um, or the statement will be there's no significant uplift. We don't know, we would need to run it longer. What you can also see here is that you see a little bit of loop above the decision boundary, meaning there are in fact like um, experiments that are flat that would be identified as having an uplift and vice versa. There's red below the boundary, meaning there are experiments that have an uplift, but you wouldn't detect it. And these are the so-called famous type one, type two errors, so false positive and false negatives. And you usually have a very high interest in keeping them under control. So the probability that any of these two errors are happening should not exceed given uh, values that are usually called alpha and beta. So this is the standard approach. And there's nothing wrong with it, but you can do better. And this is a case that, that we saw over and over again and that we wanted to fix. So this is a snapshot from our official experiment dashboard. So this is a real experiment. And um, here the scale on the y-axis is relative, but this doesn't really matter. What you easily can see is that after a pretty good start on the first one, two days, the experiment uh, performance went down and then Basically, it was around zero and rather doing excursions like to the negative part, but not really going to the positive part. Um, still, if you look at the dates, this took three weeks or even a little bit longer. So if you imagine you're now the product manager or the analyst running this experiment, like after a few days, you already have like this feeling this won't lead anywhere. But like the traditional approach tells you like, you, you can only make the call once, once you have achieved this uh, fixed running time, this pre-computed running time. So you wait and wait and nothing happens. And, and this is basically the case that, that we wanted to basically improve. And, um, and uh, the reason why we choose this, um, uh, this case was that the, the minority of experiments are successful. So this is taken from a paper, and I, I would take these numbers with a grain of salt, but in general, um, I would say like industry knowledge is that the success rate for experiments is between somewhere between 10 and 20%. I think Andreas yesterday mentioned 8.91%, something like this. So um, yeah, it's, it's way below 50%, and now you can do the easy math, like let's assume you have a success rate of 15%, and you have some running time T, okay, then you run your experiments that are successful for the full running time, but the other 85%, um, if you can dare save like, let's say 30% of your running time, then you end up with an overall um, reduction of your running time of roughly 25%. And if you're in a tech company and you run dozens or even hundreds of experiments, this is huge. Like this really enables product teams to iterate much faster. So, and, and this is where sequential testing comes into the game. Sequential testing are statistical approaches that enables you to stop dynamically. So you don't have to wait a fixed time, but you can stop earlier based on particular rules that the particular method gives you. And there are already quite a lot of approaches and they are usually coming from clinical research. So this was the strong driver um, in the 70s, 80s and 90s. And then also tech companies basically took this over and um, iterated on it. Um, but we, we really didn't find like the approach that would um, make us completely happy. And so basically we invented our own one and we called it base math. 
And um, what it basically provides is that you have the type one and uh, type two error under control. Um, you have a maximal running time given. There are also approaches um, that basically tell you you can run your experiment as long as you want, which for us doesn't really make a lot of sense because we want to plan somewhat um, what we do, like we have timelines and so on. So we want at least to know when we are finished the latest. Um, then we support both, like we support the streaming approach that I just talked about, like imagine visitor comes in and you see like every visitor one by one, every signal. Um, the truth here is that this is not the usual use case. Um, usually the exp experiment platform in a company belongs to the data architecture. You have your daily pipelines and so you look at your experiments on a daily or weekly level. And this is then called group sequential testing when new information come in as batches. Um, also in my introduction ex uh, example, I talked about the binary metric, like um, interacting or not interacting, but we also uh, support continuous metrics. You could think of the booking value that a customer or visitor brings you. In theory, um, the values could also be negative. I haven't come up with a good use case for this, but it is possible. Um, for the specialists in the audience, um, it supports the Fleming O'Brien spending curve. And um, as already mentioned, it's just a futility bound that we are supporting here. And also important, we have an open source working Python package. If you look for sequential approaches, especially in Scala or Python, which is um, the language that in data engineering is mostly spoken, um, you won't find that much. So Spotify is now working on confidence. They are on platform. They have open sourced a little bit in this direction, but um, the, the coverage is pretty poor, especially compared to R. Going back to that, a lot of the research comes from uh, clinical trials. For the batch case, for the group uh, sequential testing case, um, one can also mention that um, the number and size of batches is arbitrary. So if you feel like you want to check in every day and at some point you say, I want to check in every hour and then you say, no, I want to switch back to weeks, you can do this. This is no problem and you also do not have to fix this upfront. Um, the one piece that really makes this new in the scientific sense where we have also now written a paper is that there's no recurrent numerical integration needed, which is different from the classical approaches that are known so far. So how is this working? And here I just give a short glimpse. Um, we work with a decision boundary that is a linear increasing uh, function which is uh, displayed here as, as this dash, a dashed line, the yellow dashed line. And um, basically the slope is the minimal detectable uplift. And um, the intercept and the maximal running time are the two parameters that you want to figure out. And um, what are the requirements? Well, you want that all these AA experiments that are colored here in blue, that most of them run into this, um, into this boundary before the maximal running time. Because if they run into the boundary, you would stop and say like, it's not significantly positive. On the other hand, the red family, like if you have an experiment that has a um, positive uplift, you don't want to run it into this boundary before time t, because if it reaches time t, the maximum running time, you would declare to be um, significantly positive. And um, so you have these two requirements, and then it becomes an optimization problem that is solvable. Um, there exists a solution, and once you've done it, you are fine with the, um, with the streaming case where you see the data all the time. Uh, what is left is the batch case. And the problem with the batch case is that um, you only see like your, your difference function when you check in. So not all the time, but only at certain points in time. And um, you see there are two check-ins here and in between basically you don't know what has happened. You just know like where your um, experiment was at the first check-in time and then at the next check-in time. But like 
what happened in between could be like this green dotted curve. It could also be the black dotted curve. And um, you, you see the difference, right? With, with one, you would stop the experiment. With the other one, you would continue. And um, the traditional approach would say like, we basically calculate the probability that in between the um, boundary was hit. And then we adapt basically the, um, the decision boundary. We move them up to basically adapt for these missed stoppings. What we do instead is, we basically flip a coin with this, uh, with this uh, probability, which means that you could even stop an experiment, although it has never dropped below um, the boundary at these check-in points. This sounds a little bit strange, but it's statistically sound, and it avoids that we need to do all these recalculations. So basically, we change the way how we distribute the error um, to the different paths of the experiment. Having this set, let's see how this works in action, and I hand it over to Conrad. Thanks, Alex. Um, so in the second part of the presentation, I want to show you how you can apply our open source package. Um, so uh, first of all, the package can be installed via PyPI, uh, so you can just pip install uh, base math analysis. Um, and then you can, of course, import it into your script and create an instance of uh, the base math test. This base math test takes uh, four different parameters as an input in case of a binary endpoint. So in case you have a conversion rate, for example. In case of a continuous endpoint, for example, revenue per visitor, you would also define uh, this um, optional parameter variance A. Um, so these input parameters are mean A, so basically uh, your baseline conversion rate in this example, uh, the, uh, the effect that you want to detect in relative terms, and then your um, type 1 and type 2 error boundary. After you have specified these uh, experiment parameters, you can output uh, the required sample size and the intercept. And those two values are basically all you need to evaluate your experiment, as Alex already mentioned. Now, while you are running your experiment, um, depending a little bit on, sorry, on how your data set looks like, um, but in this case, we would um, define two accumulating uh, variables and then loop through every experiment day, one after another. Um, so we keep track, first of all, um, of the um, conversion difference, like how many conversions do we have we already seen in B versus what we already have seen in uh, variance um, A, or controlled and treatment, however you want to call it. And we also want to keep track on how many samples we have already uh, analyzed. Um, so in this case, like indicating we are um, iterating over days means that we are in the group sequential testing environment. But if you want and want to work with uh, streaming data, you could also iterate over each individual sample that you are collecting. Um, yeah, depends on your use case. Um, then we um, basically define, or like from the from the generated data, we keep track of the samples that we have um, that we have um, collected during this batch, so on the specific day, and again the differences in conversions on the specific day. And these four parameters are basically the input to the um, evaluation. Um, and that, this base math evaluation can have three different outcomes. So it can give out minus one, zero, or one. And uh, what that means is in case of a minus one, um, it means that the fertility bound has been crossed. Uh, you can stop your experiment and you can conclude that it is not uh, significantly positive. Um, just to repeat, we are basically running a one-sided test here. Um, it can be zero, the outcome. That means not enough samples, it's inconclusive, and we continue running the test. Or it could be one, meaning we reach the maximum sample size without crossing the fertility boundary, and we conclude, can conclude statistical significance, and of course, can stop the test. 
Let me quickly show you how um, a output could look like. Um, that's probably not readable for everyone, so let me try to make it a little bit larger. So here you have some synthetic um, A-B testing data. You have the different day days, uh, the visitors, the conversions of the two groups, the accumulated difference, uh, the accumulated relative treatment effect, and then the two boundaries here. Um, let's have a look how that looks like. So this is pretty much what you saw in Alex's presentation. Uh, so you have on the uh, x-axis here the days and on the y-axis the delta and conversions. In this synthetic data set, I um, used a 1% uplift and also a 1% MDU or MDE that we want to detect. Um, maybe also more interesting is um, the, uh, the graph if we look into uh, the same thing in relative terms. So you can see how this uh, average treatment effect is stabilizing at around 1% as defined in the data set and how this uh, fertility boundary is becoming closer and closer. But in this case, we would conclude uh, that the test is statistically significant um, just because that's how we defined the data set, right? Um, cool. Now, what we can also do is I can also like um, create a data set without an uplift. And then you should see that um, the, the bound is being crossed. Uh, so we can execute this a few times. Uh, what I want to show you here is how fast this is. Um, so if you have tried to apply some other packages, uh, we could even reduce the uh, number of uh, visitors or samples per day here to have uh, a few more um, evaluations. Um, this is really quick, and many implementations in R would not even allow you to like have 200 check-ins uh, in this uh, group sequential testing environment. Um, cool. Then, um, as the last part of our presentation, I want to share you some uh, learnings about um, the implementation and the rollout process. Um, so we had four different stages in our rollout process. So first of all, we implemented BaseMath as a prototype just in a Databricks notebook. Uh, we created a self-service notebook there so that in a piloting phase, some selected data teams could already test this new method in parallel to what we uh, supported all the time, the fixed, um, fixed horizon testing, basically. And during this piloting phase, we try to gather uh, user requirements, ensuring that we know how to guide them through the testing setup, um, and also trying to understand like how we need to change our uh, UI. Um, yeah. So during this piloting phase, we also then did this uh, implementation in our experimentation platform. Um, and finally rolled it out, presented it to the product teams, analysts, and so on, and provided ongoing support there. Um, let me go into a bit more detail in all these stages. Um, so as said, the first stage was to have this prototype implementation, which to our knowledge was the first like group sequential testing implementation in pure Python using a futility bound. Um, and um, why did we do this? Um, basically, we disregarded scalability, engineering best practices, or anything. We just wanted to try out this method as quickly as possible on real uh, experiments in our company. Um, so we selected a few teams, uh, data-savvy teams, to access uh, the self-service notebook uh, to analyze their experiments. Um, we had, of course, uh, we had to support this new method in parallel to our old method. And there is a problem because like, um, the two methods can, on edge cases, give different results. It shouldn't happen often, but it's just possible. So we uh, feared that some teams could cherry pick the results. Um, and that's the reason why we, uh, like why we only rolled this out to uh, data savvy teams who have like support of uh, statistical, uh, like people who know statistics and know the, the problem basically. Um, 
purpose was to get early feedback, trying to understand how we implement this in the, in the real platform. And also um, a really important learning was that um, there is a lot of misunderstanding that now with this new method, people can stop experiments um, without waiting until the maximum sample size uh, was reached. So basically what we, what we explain over and over again as analysts to our product managers is you have to wait until your sample size has been reached and then you can take a decision. So that's the peaking problem, right? People try to check their experiments all the time and then try to end it as fast as possible. And that's not possible. So that was, that was hard to explain or hard to understand for some people. Um, and of course, we also wanted to cre create trust uh, in this new method. Also, why did we implement this? We wanted to help product teams to iterate faster, right? And we wanted to understand if that's actually possible for them to really uh, use this new method to really progress faster. Indeed, it helped and also created a lot of buzz around the company. So there were some product teams who could use this new method, the other product teams who weren't even aware of this new method. And of course, that created some excitement uh, how, how product teams iterated so fast there. Um, finally, we implemented this in our experimentation platform. Um, before this implementation, our experimentation or our, our analysis layer in the experimentation platform was Looker purely. So all our statistical calculations were implemented in Looker. It was impossible to implement uh, base math in Looker or LookML. So we first ha had to disentangle all the statistical calculations from Looker and put this into a Python library. Uh, we implemented the UI changes, basically hand-holding our experimenters in choosing uh, what method to use, in what circumstances, and how to set up their experiments. Uh, and finally, like executed the jobs uh, on Databricks and using Airflow, and ensuring scalability and reliability. Uh, finally, um, what we learned is um, if, you, if you implement cool new methods and you can reduce uh, experiment runtime, it only helps if people are using them, right? So adoption is a huge topic. So it's really important to like handhold people, to give them channels to reach out to you and to support them in learning about this new method. So summarizing this, my four main learnings. Uh, first of all, try to apply a futility boundary. As Alex said, most of, or as you probably know, most of our experiments are unsuccessful. So try to end them as quickly as possible. Ensure adaptation, make sure that your, your method is being used. We think that the pilot is also really helpful to understand the needs and challenges of your experimenters in the company, and finally, offer support. Um, that's all from our side, and now we can answer any questions. Oh. Questions? No, I have to answer every. Hey, you talked about binary outcomes, but you also talked about gross bookings as an outcome. And I understand that maybe you can't share those numbers, but if you are looking at, are you sometimes deciding on which KPI to run, or are you using both for some experiments, and how does the statistics and math work out if you want to look at both numbers? Um, yeah, so usually uh, we set up our experiments to have just one success metric, uh, one metric where we would take a rollout decision on. But of course, we also have support metrics, guardrail metrics that we keep an, an eye on. Um, so far, how it is implemented on our platform is that um, we can uh, use sequential testing or base math on our success metric. Um, and we haven't implemented it yet for our guardrail metrics. So our guardrail metrics, if we show a significance decision, it's still based on, um, on a normal t-test. But yeah, we, we will implement this for guardrail metrics probably as well. 
Yeah, thank you very much for your talk. I especially liked how you uh, explained how you introduced the new method into your organization. It's often forgotten. I was wondering uh, about uh, the uh, using A-B tests as a means of heuristics, the interpret interpretability of the results. Did you observe any change between the, the two methods? Yes, so um, what we employ here is basically a binding fertility boundary. So that means a test needs to stop after it crossed the boundary, meaning like we don't stop test automatically on our platform yet. So it can happen that the test crosses the boundary and then goes above the boundary again if experimenters forget to stop the test, right? And uh, that led to some confusion if the uplift is like fluctuating around the boundary and then at some point the product manager or the experimenter decided to stop the test and then at that point it was above the boundary. Um, so we can solve this in our experimentation platform to stop tests directly or stop showing information after it crossed the boundary, but that was uh, um, a source for confusion. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, I feel you because I went exactly through the same, but on a JVM uh, environment. One question I have is you, why did you ditch, uh, uh, so you, you took the fertility boundary, but the efficiency boundary you completely missed out. I guess there are some good reasons for that. So could you elaborate on that bit, a little bit? <laughs> yeah, okay. That's easier. Um, so um, at first we we started with the um, efficacy boundary, um, but then we realized that the gain that we have will be much much smaller because, as I said, you would only gain like a reduction on fifteen percent or whatever your success rate of experiments is. Um, you can apply both. One reason why we didn't look into this by now is it just makes the math much harder so from the paper it would have been just prolonged the whole process but um, the other reason is also like um, all these um, approaches make a lot of assumptions that are not valid for example that you know like in time the value of your of your sample like this is usually delayed sometimes by days if you look at the booking or so so um, like on on paper, it's nice to have both, but like I, I don't trust it really, and so I'm I'm pretty happy basically to give the experiment like this time to to really show a good performance and not to stop it early in this case, especially be, uh, as said because it's not uh, giving us so much gain in practice. Any more questions? Okay, in that case, thank you, Alexander and Conrad. <laughs>